Okay, and so welcome everybody to our Board Fiduciary Responsibilities webinar with Jenny Ann Blackson. We're glad that you have been able to join us today. Um, I will share with you a little bit about Jenny Ann. Um, so Jenny is actually has her roots here in Kentucky. She is from Harlan County. She has four decades of experience working in various nonprofits. And I don't know if I'm going to get this entire list right, um, but she has done nonprofit education work in just about every sector you can imagine. Um, education, the arts, um, uh, domestic violence, um, food security. Uh, and I know I'm missing some, Jenny, so you can okay. fill those in if you want. But she has really run the gamut with um, working with many, many different kinds of nonprofits. And she currently is a nonprofit consultant um, in Ellensburg, Washington. And so she's joining us from the West Coast today. Um, and she also is a part time employee for Fish Food Bank in Ellensburg. So, um, Jenny, we will turn it over to you. And um, if I missed anything that you want folks to know about you, feel free to, to share with them. All right. Well, good morning, everyone from Ellensburg, Washington, a tiny little town right in the middle of the state. Um, I'm about 100 miles from Seattle and about 100 miles from Spokane and about 150 from Canada and about 100 from Oregon. And so I've moved out here about seven years ago, but absolutely my heart and soul is a Kentuckian and it was good to be back a couple weeks ago. Um, so, but today we're gonna talk about the fiduciary responsibility of board members. And I've got a little PowerPoint. It's gonna let me share. Yeah. So we will. Halloween is my, um, favorite time of year. So I was pretty tickled when I found this PowerPoint template. And yeah, sometimes the fiduciary responsibilities of being a nonprofit board member can be a little spooky because, and as Donna mentioned, I've been around a few years and have been on staff at a variety of nonprofits. And I've also served on boards of directors. And typically when, when we agree to do that, it's because we're drawn to the, to the mission work of the board. Um, the Bria Arts Council was one of my first boards. I love the arts, I love what it did. I was on the board at Mountain Maternal and Planned Parenthood for a while because those things were values that I, that I shared. And sometimes we serve on a board because of some sort of professional connection or reason. And although the fiduciary responsibilities of being a nonprofit board member are really among the most, if not the most important, rarely the reason that we choose to be on a board. Sometimes it's a, a rude awakening. <laughs> and so Donna mentioned some of my sectors and the pre-session pre -question questionnaire that if some of you all filled out. We have folks in this room who've served on chambers of commerce. They've worked in the housing sector with United Ways and Red Cross in the areas of substance abuse and addiction, education, festivals, community festivals, public government entities, um, religious entities, homelessness, public TV, healthcare, foundations, food security, public libraries, the arts, school booster clubs, and universities. We've about got it covered, I believe. Um, and so do not be share, shy about sharing your own expertise. Um, if you've got something, raise your hand or post it up in the chat box. And um, I know there's a lot of expertise in this Zoom room. So why do nonprofit board members have this fiduciary responsibility? As a nonprofit, the IRS has bestowed a special designation on it, the 501 See, I found a little typo, sorry. That should be 501c3 status. And it basically means as a nonprofit, we don't pay taxes, income taxes and most other taxes. So this special status means that the governing body, the board of directors is responsible for making sure the organization's funds are used for the benefit of clients, programs, mission work, and not used for the benefit of any one individual whether it's a board member, a staff member, or someone else. So you can't sort of give any special financial favors. The money has to be spent for the good of the organization. 
it seems simple, but sometimes people have ways of blurring the lines. This fiduciary responsibility simply means that board members must make decisions that are objective, unselfish, responsible, honest, trustworthy, and efficient. And yep, the IRS and others kind of look at if it's a frivolous expense for a nonprofit, believe it or not. So a responsibility, a major one of yours as a board member is to maintain this financial integrity. You are a trustee of these organizations' assets and you must ensure it remains financially sound. And to be aware if it's headed to a place of financial unsoundness. You always wanna be able to pay your bills. And if you can't pay your bills as far ahead as you can see, then you might have to make hard decisions. So there's a lot of different stuff that's a part of this fiduciary responsibility, budgeting, employee compensation, reviewing financial reports, handling the money, the Form 990, the infamous Form 990, we'll talk more about that later, investments and audits. So here's a few questions that have already been submitted that I'm gonna just stick right here in and chat about those right now. Someone asked about the best software for nonprofit accounting and, and like a lot of answers, it's, it depends. And it basically depends on how much money you're gonna be accounting for, how big is your budget? Um, you know, I was on the board of a small volunteer sports car club and we spent, I and mean, we had a lot of money coming in and going out because of events, but overall it was probably less than 20,000. And we had an accountant who kept the books and did the 990 and he basically did it with spreadsheets and stuff. The one I always liked for nonprofits who were in the half million dollar budget and up a little bit is QuickBooks. And there's been specific versions for nonprofit that lets you do your fund-based accounting so you can account for the different grants. And, and that's one of the main things to ask yourself when you're shopping for software is what do you need on that back end? What are your funders asking for? What do you want to show your board? How do you want to make your financial decisions? Um, you know, I want to know if I got a grant from ABC for $50,000, am I spending within that $50,000? Am I going over? Am I going under? Things like that. So I've worked at large organizations like Girl Scouts, and they used really fancy stuff. I think it was called American Fundware, and it talked to the, the fundraising database. So when we entered gifts in it, it talked to the accounting program and so that's kind of a high end. And then there's just a variety along the way. Do searches, ask other nonprofits. If you've got an accountant on your board and hopefully you do, or somebody in the financial, you know, ask them. And it just really depends on the needs of your organization. Absolutely bank statements can be, whoops, sorry, can be presented. Um, And that can happen in a variety of ways. And one of the things I'm gonna send you after the meeting is the answer to the third question, this little checklist or list of things that it's really, really good for board members to look at in terms of finances. The bank statements are one of those checks and balances things. So if it's a tiny little organization like with two employees, the bank statement might even be sent to the board treasurer who opens it up, looks at it, eyeballing it for anything that might be out of flat and then either giving it over to staff to reconcile or reconciling it themselves. With online banking, that's less of a necessity. I mean, that's how you can not do that. If a board member has access to online banking, they can check it daily and stuff. It's one of those multiple accountability things that you'll hear me talk about um, the rest of our time together. And yeah, there's a standard list of financial information and reports that staff should provide to board members or board members should be able to access. And a basic revenue and expense, profit and loss, whatever what you want to call it. I like to see those for the most recently ended month. And I like it to show, you know, the surplus or deficit. And then I like to see a column that is the fiscal year to date. 
um, a budget comparison that would show your actual expenses to what you plan to expend. Again, it might be something you see month by month or for the fiscal year to date. Um, calendaring is always an issue when you're looking at budget comparisons because you might develop your budget and you might have a $2,500 insurance payment, but it only comes out in January. And so you go a long way, way under budget and then bam, you're there. And if it's gone up, you're a little over budget and stuff, but you can, uh, you can fix that. Um, a balance sheet, sometimes called a statement of um, net worth, and that just kind of shows a snapshot, a financial snapshot of where that organization is at that day. The important thing about a balance sheet is it shows your receivables, money that is owed you, might be a grant payment, who knows, um, or contract payment, and then it shows your liabilities, money you owe somewhere. Um, I think it's really important for board members to pay attention, particularly to the liabilities. And if you don't know what is in that number, ask, ask for the detail. Um, and be insistent about it. So there's a few questions. And of course there are horror stories. We have horror stories about board members' fiduciary responsibilities. Some of these I've experienced and some of these have been shared with me at similar workshops and some of these have been shared with me by others. And um, not paying your federal payroll taxes is the big bad wolf of a nonprofit's fiduciary responsibility. And it happens more than I ever imagined that it would maybe 40 years ago. You got to pay those taxes because if you don't, the IRS is going to come after you. And if you don't, the organization doesn't have the money, it's going to come after personal assets of board members. And it's happened. And it just, it seems like a no brainer, but it just, it happens. And, you know, if you've got a fairly substantial payroll and you're looking at eight or $9,000 every quarter and you're, you've not paid attention to cash flow, it can be a temptation to fall in that trap of using that money to cover these costs and you're going to make it up. Eventually it catches up to you. Somebody's going to pay it and they're going to pay fees and interest and all that kind of you can negotiate. And um, for example, a board that um, found out shortly after new board members came on that nobody had been doing this and you know it was too late and they came after that board, that board of directors, they negotiated a payment plan and all of that and, and it kind of worked out. So hand in hand with that, anything you're dealing with IRS becomes the scary, scary part. Um, Nonprofits file the form 990, that's your tax return. You don't pay taxes, but you have to file this return. And if you don't, the IRS doesn't like it because that's how the IRS knows your organization is remaining a nonprofit and the board of directors is ensuring this, they're enacting their fiduciary responsibility by ensuring that everything's operating above board financially. And that document is public, anybody can look at it. And there's a variety of ways to see it. And a nonprofit is obligated to provide it to a person should the person request it. You're usually gonna want a CPA to do your 990. Um, if you're big enough to have a good accountant on staff, um, they may do it. If you're having an independent CPA audit, which I bet many of you do, then it typically doing the 990 is a part of that audit contract. So, you know, what happens to the board if financial mismanagement, embezzlement, or et cetera takes place? The board's responsible. So if somebody runs off with money to pay your rent and you find out you're six months behind, somebody's gonna have to pay that six months of rent. Um, so there's also a thing about allowing excess private benefits. The IRS is going to look at things that happen if a nonprofit chooses to do business with a board member or a staff. Not totally out of the question with the appropriate conflict of interest things, but the IRS is going to look at it. And there should always be and a bid option. So yeah, if you're in a small town and there's one grocery store, 
and you have to buy supplies for this program event at that one grocery store, you're going to document that some way, especially if that grocery store owner is connected to your organization in any way. That's a true story from my past. And um, you, the board is who has to do the due diligence to make sure that there isn't some insider thing that people are awarding contracts or money to. Another potential issue for board members is legal issues. Um, there's always the possibility you could be sued by donors, clients, staff, volunteers, happens all the time. And, you know, it's just one of the things you have to be aware of. The risk can be small if the board members take certain measures. And the, the main measure is making sure the organization has directors and officers liability insurance and appropriate conflict of interest statements. Directors and officers liabilities, can, it, the insurance can be expensive and it's, it's kind of like that little piece of payroll taxes. You, you know, a lot of nonprofits might think we just cannot spend $3,000 on this insurance. Um, we're just going to get by without it. Everything will be okay. And many times, most of the time even, it is okay, but other times it's not. Um, about 10 years ago, maybe longer, anyway, when I learned about the importance of DNO liability insurance, I would no longer serve on a board that didn't have it. It's just, I insist. And it's a cost of doing business. And so you really have to, you know, if this nonprofit thinks it really can't afford it, you have to figure out how to afford it. Or then you have to re-examine if the nonprofit can afford to do its mission work. I'm not seeing any questions yet. Is that right, Donna? Okay. So there again, your responsibility as a nonprofit board member is to maintain this financial integrity. You're the trustee. Now, how do you do this? It's that second little paragraph. Information is essential. You cannot perform your fiduciary responsibility in the manner required if you don't have information. And it's got to be current and correct. And it's got to be presented in a way that is easy to read and understand. And you have to have the opportunity to ask questions and in some cases provide input. Again, it kind of sounds like a no brainer. But I've worked with boards and been on boards where staff would say, oh, it's going to be okay. I'll get that to you next month. And no, 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 no. And it, it was rarely okay. So, I mentioned the variety of financial tasks that are a part of a board member's fiduciary work, and here they are. Always good to engage the board in budgeting. Um, it's usually developed in conjunction with the staff, depending on how big your organization is, there may be a variety of committees. It is good for the board, a board member, if not all board members, to be at the table during this process because this is some of the information that you need to know to make informed decisions. Because as you budget, it's gonna show what the organization expenses are, which is gonna show you what, how much money you need to bring in. It also tells you about your programming and other costs. Um, a lot of grants I've submitted for the past year are asking a question about cost benefit for individual. And so they're looking at the grant size and divided it by the number of participants and so they're looking at stuff like that. Do you want to spend $5,000 on a person or $500? That kind of stuff. The board is the body that should set a compensation schedule for employees, not necessarily individual staff salaries, except the director, but in general, um, administrative staff are going to make this much per hour and program staff is going to be salary at this level. And there again, this that you can't do this if you don't have the information about your budgeting, which will be, you know, your staff costs. What are people already making? And then this decision needs to be made with some benchmarking because that's something. If you're in an area where most executive directors are making uh, seventy-five thousand dollars a year, and you find out that you're paying your executive director three hundred thousand dollars a year, I would ask questions about that. And there's all kinds of salary surveys out there that you can get this information. Um, one of the resources that will be on the resource slide is the Kentucky, the Center for Nonprofit Leadership at the University of Kentucky. 
I think it's through the extension officers, they have a salary um, review that you can access. It doesn't have to be every single year, but you know, every now and again, I think particularly when an organization grows a great deal in a short period of time, you're operating with a $150,000 budget and you get a million dollar grant, that's when you must, you know, the board says, okay, let's let's take a look. We're going to be hiring staff and we want to make sure we do it equitably. We've got about it. Handling the money. So this is where we start talking about multiple accountabilities for your policies about handling the money and not just cash, but checks and any kind of revenue. Basically, more than one person needs to have eyes on the money. And so how you do this really depends on your staffing situation. If it's a small organization with two or three people or less, a board member is probably gonna be a part of this multiple accountabilities. But for example, if I'm the person opening the mail, I'm giving the check to somebody else to put in the bank, and a third person is looking at my income report compared to the deposit report. And that's how they follow the path of this check from the first person who touches it to the second to the third. Income to a bookkeeper in the bank and an accountant is looking at it. Um, some places have two people that open the mail together. So there's no one person doing that. At my current job at the food bank, we handle a little bit of cash, um, cash donations that come in donor boxes or at the Meals on Wheels site. And so they have two people counted on site. It comes to me with a sheet that they counted an initial and I'm the third count. And then when you get it to the bank, the teller is counting it there too. Um, so these types of multiple accountabilities, and it's, it's not because you're suspicious or you think people are gonna do something bad. This is a part of the transparency that all nonprofits should really strive to do. And it really protects your staff and your board. Um, and so a lot of this is, I think I finish at the end here saying, don't be scared about your fiduciary responsibility because all of these things make the organization stronger. I firmly believe that and I've seen it. So if your nonprofit gets to the point where it's financial resources, oh, there's another typo, I was off my game here. Sorry, folks. Um, if you're ready to invest, then it's the board of directors that will establish the investment policy. And although it's tempting, if you've got a board member who's a financial advisor, it's, I don't recommend doing business with board members. I recommend having these sectors on your board. Different people do that different ways. And, you know, um, you just have to decide for your organization, um, but I don't recommend it. And so I do recommend that you have people who are very knowledgeable about investments helping you develop this policy, whether it's a board member or a board member with some community volunteers. And it may be um, if you put out a request for proposals for investment firms to bid on your investments, you know, you might even engage that person in an advisory way to make sure your policy covers all the bases that that person might need covered. If you don't have enough to invest yet, you don't have to worry about this. As most nonprofits are going to have a requirement for an independent audit, particularly if you are getting large grants, private grants, government grants. Um, and there again, this is something, the scariest thing about it is how much it's going to cost. And I've seen a lot of new nonprofits have some real sticker shock when they find out. But there again, this is something that protects everybody involved and it tells anybody who looks at it, that this nonprofit is doing what it should. It will also tell people that this nonprofit is not gonna make it. And that's um, a going concern clause. And that's something that can be a death knell um, on a nonprofit. And it basically is that point in time when the CPAs can't see any proof of revenue to cover ongoing expenses. When your nonprofit has the audit, it should not go to the staff initially. The staff's going to be very involved in the development and providing information and all of that. But 
the auditor should come to a board meeting and present that audit to the board. It will be a management letter that says, you know, everything's copacetic here or things aren't copacetic. You may have some findings or recommendations that could be minuscule. You know, it might say, oh, we found five invoices that weren't approved. You need to strengthen that process, yada, yada. And, um, but typically it's the management letter that will identify any very serious problems. Many of your funders will require a copy of the audit. And a part of the whole process is the auditor will say, if you've gotten a grant from the Ford Foundation, the Ford Foundation will get a letter saying that ABC nonprofit got this grant to do this, will you confirm it? And they sign off and send it back. So the financial reporting is a big part of the way a board member gets information to make its decisions. And so it's gotta be accurate and timely financial reports provided to board members, it's just essential. It is your ability to make informed decisions. And we're gonna talk some more about the financial reports, but I wanna to touch on the 990. And like I said earlier, we don't have to pay taxes as a nonprofit organization, but we all are required to file a return. One of the documents I'm gonna send you is just a little one pager information sheet. And basically this is your annual tax return. You're obligated to file it and it is a public document. It's the best way that a nonprofit is transparent with the public about policies, financial management, board members, donors, key employees, and expenses, program and fundraising. You may be asked for a copy of your 990 from foundations or other entities. And typically your CPA is gonna do this. And anybody who wants to can see it. There is a public document. And so after the IRS gets it, they send it to something called godstar.com. And you can log on to Godstar and ask to see 990s of nonprofits and foundations and stuff. You're also required as a nonprofit to provide it if someone walks in and asks for it. In 40 years of working at nonprofits, that's never happened, so I don't worry about it too much. Um, I do use Godstar to look up information on nonprofits and foundations. And so the deadline depends on when your fiscal year is. And basically, you have to file it on the 15th day of the fifth month after the close of your nonprofit's fiscal year. I'm going to send you that document. And then... I want to show you one other thing. Let me stop this share and then I'm going to share something else. Hmm. We do have a question that just came into the chat. So do you want to? Okay. Um, um, somebody said, I know sometimes people get confused, but just because someone is a nonprofit, they still pay sales tax unless they are exempt, right? That is correct. And in Kentucky, once you have your 501c3 status, you then apply to the Kentucky Department of Revenue for your sales tax exemption. I just went through that process with a, a new little nonprofit down in Eastern Kentucky. And um, it, it's not too big of a pain. You have to provide a little bit of financial information. So you kind of have to have operate for a month or two before you can, but they got theirs really quickly. And if you have paid a big amount of tax prior to getting that approval, you can apply to get that refunded. And that is state sales tax. Nonprofits in Washington state do not have that um, ability. We all pay sales tax and it's, I think it's 8.2 in this town. And there's other taxes though that you will pay. If you have vehicles, you're gonna to have to pay that usage tax. Um, property tax, it depends. But yeah, sales tax, you have to go through another process, but you can get approval to not pay that. And you'll get a little number from the state. And then there will be, sometimes you go to a store and they have you fill it out every time you make a purchase. Other bigger stores like Walmart, they'll have you fill out one and they'll keep it on file and then you'll have a little card. So each time somebody buys something, um, you can um, not pay tax. And if you are purchasing something from another state, you can go through a, like a one-time approval process. I've never had to do that. So I don't know how easy and quickly it is. 
Okay, so you all should be looking at uh, something that looks like a tax return. This is yep. part six of the 990, and it asks you questions about your board of directors, the governing body, and the management of your organization. I look at this page a lot when I'm trying to decide, am I gonna work with a nonprofit? Am I doing grant routing? What's a funder gonna say if they look at that? And I'm, you know, I'm looking for the answers that indicate good management. Like, did any officer, director, that's number two, or key employee have a family relationship or business relationship with any other officer or member? I like to see no there all the time. Uh, did the organization, and this means the board member, become aware during the year of a significant diversion of the organization's assets? If I see yes there, I've got a lot of questions. So that means did the board suddenly find out that staff spent a grant money designated for ABC and they spent it on XYZ? and so on. And then it's down here about your policies. And so one of the questions, 11A, is has the organization provided a copy of this form to all members of its governing body before filing the form? It wants to know that you as a board member reviewed this form before it was sent to the IRS. It's good practice. It's a good fiduciary responsibility. And then it's gonna ask about policy. Do you have a whistleblower policy? You need one. Do you have a, a document retention and destruction policy? Depending on what field you work in, that's going to be different. Um, you know, if you're in a healthcare industry, that's one thing. You've got to talk about how you lock that stuff up and things like that. So your 990 is more than just a financial report to the IRS. It's really a lot of information provided to the community. I think we have another chat. Oh. We do, yep. Yeah. So what are the requirements to become exempt? Some 501Cs are not exempt, right? So there's a variety of 501C codes. And um, it just depends. There's membership. There's one for membership. There's one for churches. There's one for schools and et cetera. Um, for the most part, a 501c is going to be a nonprofit, but then it's going to be a different kind, a membership organization. Its proceeds automatically, by nature of its 501c3, I think it's a four, don't quote me, they are required for their proceeds to benefit the members of the organization. And so it's kind of, you know, regardless of the mission of that organization, um, you know, if I join this club because we're bird watchers and we get a grant to go bird watching in South America. Um, they can't use that to send me to Alaska to watch whales, whatever, if that makes a little bit of sense. Um, and so you just have to know your organization and the code. And there is a bunch of stuff on the internet. All you gotta do is like Google that. Uh, does sharing the 990 with the governing board include them all or just the treasurer or exec committee? Everybody, all board members should look at the 990, whether they want to or not. I mean, it's a really boring document for the most part, but it's very informative. And I'm going to send you that blank 990, the whole form, and you all can, you can go through it yourself and see the questions. And if you don't know the answers to them, you might maybe make that a discussion at the next board meeting to get those answers, those questions answered. Um, if the treasurer, yes, Jane. Question, this regards the 990. Um, I'm, I work with the Upper Cumberland Community Foundation an affiliate of the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky. And as our advisory board for our little affiliate, um, I believe we have a fiduciary responsibility for um, monies that are entrusted to our affiliate, either directly to us or funneled to us through the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky. That kind of attenuated relationship would still, I believe, still make us have a fiduciary responsibility to, to the extent that we need to be familiar with the Appalachian, the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky's. 990 and accounting processes. And 
that that is my concern that um, that many people just aren't familiar with the 990 itself. So is the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky the fiscal agent for your part? Um, they they manage all the funds. They they define themselves differently. Have, they have a different relationship to different ones of the funds. But yes, we pay out of the funds that we have and or are given to us or administered by us, they they are um, they are an agent, yes. So who makes decisions about the funds that you all administer? And Kathy might be the one. So Kathy is, with, and I think Bobby's here too with the foundation, but can explain uh, the maybe the relationship between the affiliates. It's the a local uh, geographic component fund that, that Jane's referring to. And yes, it, it is a fund. We do have fiscal uh, funds, fiscal sponsored funds as well, but the one that, that's the affiliate is, uh, is a geographic component fund. And the local advisory board does, they make all the decisions on that. And the foundation as a whole, that 990 is on the website. It, I mean, it's for everybody. It's public. Uh, so we, uh -huh. we put that on the website. And that's, yeah, that's another good good practice to do. Bobby, what? anything to add? Uh, no, I think I think Kathy essentially covered it. Um, just in terms of policy, we also, the local boards on the affiliate funds uh, make the decisions on how to spend that board, but those decisions are ratified by our larger board of directors before. So knowing all of that, I, I would come down, Jane, saying, yes, it would be good for your advisory committee to be as familiar as possible. And it sounds like that that would be an easy, I mean, you know, maybe you get someone to go talk to your advisory committee and go over the 990 or even just allow you to ask questions. Um, if there are concerns, then there's a whole other route to go that I think communication is key. Now, I don't think your advisory board or committee has the legal fiduciary responsibilities that the board of the fiscal foundation does. It doesn't mean you can't be sued. It doesn't mean people can't try to come after you. Um, but if they're the fiscal agents, that legal fiduciary responsibility rests with that board of directors. Does that answer your question? Um, it, that's good information. Yes, thank okay. you for providing that good information. I think that, um, and my other question is, and this is to Kathy and Bobby, is our local affiliate board covered by the director's um, officer's insurance provided by the app? Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky. I'm glad you asked that question because I, one of the things that I sat and thought about whenever she mentioned that earlier was, sorry about Hank, um, was do, are, is, are our affiliates named in the insurance policy, which I'm assuming, which I've not seen, but are, is our, are our affiliates named? Just something to throw out there. I'm Kathy pretty sure Bobby. they are, but I will I will check on that and get that out there later. Yep. Very good. That's a situ I'm gonna look into that situation, that whole structure a little bit more. I know I've worked with um groups that here in Ellensburg there is something called the Laughing Horse Arts Foundation, and it's a 501c3 umbrella for very little, mostly volunteer arts organizations, the film festival. A musical theater and so we benefit from their 501c3 status but all of our financial information fed them into 1990 that was all of the organizations that were a part of this foundation um anyway. other questions right now I, that was something since we're on this subject uh, the only other place i've ever seen this is in there are different organizations out there that are um, companies that are act as the 501c3 for, for school um, sports or, or uh, organizations that you can file under them so you don't have to get your own 501c3. But they 
are in, in churches actually, you know, like the United Methodist Church is the umbrella, but you know, all the, all, I know churches are very different than this, but I, I would like to understand more of how all of that works with the IRS because every time I've ever worked, except for this organization, there's been very little help or input from those parent organizations. And it's almost like you're totally left on your own. But this this setup is more like we are we are our individual regions are funds, if that makes any sense. And then we have sub funds under the fund. Right. Nothing's ever simple, is it, Jane? Well, my concern is that, that I haven't been able to find an any more recent 990 than 2018 on the website. I'm going to go to the state government website to see if it's um, there, but that's that's problematic. I think that's a problem. Jane, we can uh, I can double check that on the website to make sure it's the updated one, but we can also provide it for you. Yeah, yeah well, I, but, but I ought not have to ask for it. That's the whole thing. That 990 is what protects your nonprofit status, your compliance with that. And, and we've worked so hard with our local affiliate to build it up and to offer assurances to those who are interested in participating in philanthropic activities that we, we, are, we are crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. And, um, and I've already, I've had two questions about the 990. Gary responded to one of them and I didn't even bother to forward the second one. Um, because people who are savvy know what to ask for and where to look. And uh, there's no need to shoot ourselves in the foot. I'm not airing any dirty linen. I'm just saying, when I go to the website, what I find. And if I send someone to the uh, Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky's website, they're going to find the same thing. And if it's three or four years out of date, that, that to me is a problem that must be remedied. And I think Jane is pretty much right. And I mean, it's what I've sort of been saying. And it is common for things. Now, GuideStar will always run a year or two behind. And sometimes websites will too. Sounds like Bobby and Kathy are kind of on this and are going to get you a 990. I'm going to stay in touch and, and, and help make that happen. And ideally, um, absolutely, that information should flow to folks with concerns like this and to the public when when it's when it's needed by those those folks. If we're out here spreading the word about this and trying to encourage folks who are no longer around here to come back and support this area, um, they're going to have their financial advisor go through and, and check on these things, or they're going to do it themselves. They're not even going to follow up. <laughs> and there again, I think that, you know, it's not anything to be afraid of. It's something that strengthens your organization that will get you in touch with donors. And, um, you know, it can be a positive thing. Okay. I have a few more things I want to touch on before we leave here. We talked about the 990. Here are some resources, and I will be sending you this whole PowerPoint. Um, Board Source, the Foundation Group, Kentucky Nonprofit Network, Council on Nonprofits. These will be live links when you get this. There's more out there. Frequently specific, very big national organizations have a lot of board resources. When I was on the board of Planned Parenthood, we had a notebook about being a nonprofit board member information and information about the organization. And basically don't be afraid of your fiduciary responsibility. It's something to understand and use to make sure your nonprofit is strong. Ask questions. If you don't understand financial information, ask to see the budget, the balance sheet, revenue and expense, and ask about the information you see there. We've got another chat coming up. Oh, good. Kathy just posted up that all of the affiliate board members are covered in the directors and offices liability. Thank you, Kathy. That's really good news. 
I also just checked with our finance director. Um, the reason the 2019 audit is not yet up on the website is, or the reason the 990 is not up on the website yet is because we just completed our 2019 audit very recently. Um, so that will be put up as soon as it's ready to go. But that's, that's why. And that's also why the 2020 is not up there because we are in the middle of our 2020 audit. Great. All right, thank you, Bobby. Um, other questions at this moment in time? Okay, another document I'm going to be sending you. I will share it right now. Is a checklist. I, I said I would get back to the financial information you should see in addition to the 990. On a monthly basis, I just highly encourage board members to see a revenue and expense or profit and loss for the most recent month and for the fiscal year to date and look at them and ask questions about them. A budget comparison is also another really good document for board members to have. You've worked on the budget. You wanna see how, how you did. A budget's your best guess. It's based on a lot of facts, but it's still your best guess. Um, ever had a year when you budgeted a certain amount for postage back when we sent a lot of mail and then postage increased and you didn't know about it and you always over budget in that line item. Um, you know, anything that has the possibility to be increased, whether it's your rent or your insurance cost or supply cost or whatever, you hope your budget will account for that, but it frequently does not. The balance sheet is the thing I talked about that's another thing important to look at. You might see this monthly at the end of the month. It might be a little less frequently. Shows your receivable, what you're owed, grants, contractual payments, and your liabilities, what the organization owes, payroll taxes, contractual payments, property taxes, et cetera. The liabilities is really important. And if it's a number you're not comfortable with, you thought it was gonna be 2,500 and it was 25,000, ask why, and then ask for the detail. If it's this and that and the other, just tell your accountant, your staff, whomever, you wanna see the detail. Um, that's a place where if people aren't paying their payroll taxes. That liability is gonna pile up there because if payroll is done, it's accounted for in just about every single accounting program as a liability and it'll show up on that balance sheet. A lot of fiduciary responsibility centers around checks and balances, and that, that's some of those policy questions you'll answer on the 990 or about checks and balances. And it just depends like so much on the size of the nonprofit in terms of budget and staffing. Um, board members may be needed to, need to be more involved in financial management to uh, maintain these checks and balances if the organization is smaller. And this might be such things as signing or co-signing checks. It might be if the check's over X amount of dollars, then it needs a second board signature. It might be the board member always signs payroll checks. In this day of electronic banking and bill.com payment, stuff like that, if a nonprofit uses such a means to pay bills, the board member may need to be engaged to approve the expenses online prior to payment. And this is after a staff has approved them. Um, there are again, multiple accountability. So the staff person knows that this bill is for supplies for XYZ program paid by that grant. And the board member has to have confidence that that piece has happened. They're just looking at it to see if there's anything untoward, so to speak, doing that second approval. The multiple accountabilities dealing with revenue and expenses. One person should not be able to receive an invoice, approve the invoice, pay the invoice, sign the check, et cetera. No single individual should be able to transact a financial happening from start to finish. There needs to be a second or third set of eyes on the trans transaction. And this could be like when you take checks, if you're still doing checks to a board member for signature, it's not just a check and you telling them, well, this is for Jenny's presentation. You've attached an invoice and maybe even an agenda to the meeting. So they have, quote, the backup material. That backup material, it's what an auditor is gonna look at. And most likely on that backup material, an executive director has put their approval on it. 
and that board member before they sign the check is looking at that as well. If you're large enough to have a purchase order system, that's pretty good because someone can do a purchase order planning the purchase. Um, they have staff approval by someone on up the, the ladder. And then once the purchase order is approved, they make the purchase and then the bookkeeper or accountant just connects the approved purchase order with the invoice when it arrives. Um, with all of this, if you're buying stuff, you're gonna wanna have some inventory control. So if you bought 500 folders to give to parents, you want somebody to sign off that, oh, I counted and there's 500 in that box. When you give them out, you might have to have somebody sign out that, oh, we gave 500 parents these folders. Invoices should be clearly approved and coded to the appropriate revenue source before they get to the person paying the bill and certainly before they get to the person signing the check or approving the payment. Bank statements, reconciliation of bank statements is another good way for board members to know what's happening day to day. Again, with electronic banking and stuff, these are becoming a little obsolete. And so to me, it's much easier to give the board member access to the online bank and let them check it weekly or daily or monthly, you know, but make sure they are checking it at least monthly. If you still have bank statements and you're a tiny little organization, it might be good to send the bank statement to the board who just looks at it to see if there's anything out of whack. Once a year, the board should be involved in developing the fiscal year budget and that involvement, the level of involvement depends again on the size and kind of budget of the organization. It's a small organization sort of operating on a shoestring grant to grant, you might wanna engage the whole board in a lot of discussion about the budget. If you're a huge organization, you might use committees and board members might be on committees with staff. Annually for most nonprofits, the board of directors is gonna accept the independent audit as a fiscal year and you should look at it and you should ask questions about it. The other thing I recommend and not everybody does it this way, but I always did it is I had a 12 month cash flow statement that would always show projected revenue and expenses 12 months ahead different and separate from the fiscal year. So if I'm looking at a cash flow statement right now, I'm looking at October through September, 2022. At the end of October, I update everything. I get a new bank balance. I delete October and I'm looking at November, 2021 to October 31, 2022. Some of you may know a, a person that I worked with years ago at Mesa, Carol Lamb. I know Donna knew her, she passed this past year. She taught me this about 25 years ago and I've been using it ever since. I use it personally, I'm using it in the little business my daughter and I've started and I highly recommend nonprofits use it. I don't have a sample, but I'm gonna develop one and I can send that to you all too. It kind of seems like a lot of work, but especially if you don't have a lot of, if you've got cash flow issues, it's almost critical to have something like this. Okay. Hey, and we've got a question in the chat if we've got cool. to. Um, how can a board member verify that practice matches policy? Yeah. Asking yeah. a step, but then how to verify? Yeah. So you just have to watch for things. So when you get that audit, you're looking for recommendations or a management letter clause that says things like, we noticed there were many invoices that were not approved by the executive director before they were paid. Your policy says that always has to happen and it obviously is not happening. So that's something you're gonna hear about once a year. On a sort of daily basis, depending on how involved your board is, if you're meeting monthly and you start getting excuses instead of information, you can just about bet that somebody's not following policy. If it's at the end of the month, and you don't have financials at October 31st because, oh, well, we st we're still working on that. Ask why. And then you follow up every single day until you get that financial report. Um, depending on your relationship and the nonprofit, I mean, if it's a visit the office, drop in. I don't think you have to be sneaky about anything or, you know, surprise visit or something, but. I think as a nonprofit board member, you should see facilities and things. And that's when you can look for, you know, do they have the exit signs lit up, which is a safety factor that's probably in your policies and, and other little things like that. 
do they have locking file cabinets? It's a simple question. Can they lock their check that they've not written up? Do they lock it? They, we, we deposit once a week where I live or where I work. And so I put the checks in the safe. The safe key is in my desk, locked with my key. The deputy director has another key. Nobody gets in the safe that I don't know about it or Jeff doesn't know about it. And so you ask those kinds of questions. And those are questions that auditors ask as well. And you just, you have to kind of be on top of the information. And if you're not getting the information, big red flag. What other questions do you all have for me? Okay, I'm gonna send my PowerPoint. I'm gonna send the little 990 info sheet. I'm gonna send a blank 990 form. I'm gonna send the check sheet. And in a day or two, I'm gonna send a sample cash flow statement. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jenny. And it was great, buddy, for your good questions and your participation. You. And we will see you all. Um, let me tell you real quickly for our November webinar, um, that is really scheduled the day before Thanksgiving. And so what we're going to do is bump that up to December 1st so that we are not having a webinar the day before Thanksgiving. So um, just be aware of that. I'll send that out in an email. We are going to talk about youth philanthropy at the next webinar and then do a follow up discussion around youth philanthropy because I know that is something that a lot of the affiliates are interested in. So anyway, thanks a lot and everybody have a great day. And thank, thank you. you all. Thanks, y'all. Thank bye bye. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you.